And good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Jane Rickson, uh, and I'm honoured to be here. I'd like to thank the OECD for sponsoring me, for being here. Um, good evening, Canberra. I feel like I'm on the Eurovision Song Contest. Good evening, Canberra. <laughs> and uh, good morning, uh, Copenhagen. So. Uh, so the title of my talk is this, Input Constraints to Food Production, the Impacts of Soil Degradation. I'm extremely grateful to Professor for mentioning soils because I'm going to be very biased as a soil scientist and say all of our discussions are rooted in soils. And uh, every pun intended. Um, as an introduction, I'd like to also mention, uh, oh, the, uh, unfortunately it's covered uh, by our presentation here, but 2015 is the International Year of Soils. How many people knew that? Excellent, very good, <laughs> very bad, the rest of you. But it is the International Year of Soils, so it's very, very appropriate uh, that we're having this conference. The, I'd like to uh, acknowledge my co-authors that are listed in the journal um, that have contributed to this paper, and I'm simply just the, the mouthpiece. <laughs> Do go on a bit sometimes. Um, these uh, uh, slides that I've shown, this, this illustrates the problem I'm going to be talking about, that soil degradation is key to our ability to produce sufficient food globally. Um, most people don't associate the UK as being a, an area with uh, soil erosion, but all of these slides were taken from fields local to, to my university, to Cranfield in Bedfordshire. So we do have problems of soil erosion. It's all relative, but it is certainly the impact on food production that I'm going to try and cover in my paper today. So, the importance of so soil in food production. Yes, I'm biased. I will admit that I'm biased, but I would argue this is the root of what we should be talking about today. 94% of all food globally originates from terrestrial environments. I haven't just made that up to justify my job. Uh, this is actually UN FAO um, official statistics. And therefore, soil is so important to the food that is being produced. Healthy soils are, by definition, able to sustain plant and animal productivity. So again, if you all imagine what you had for breakfast this morning, or sorry, for lunch in <laughs> Australia, or breakfast in Copenhagen, how much of that came from the soil? Now, those of you that had fish, and I know we're having a presentation on fish later on, so I'll let you off, but the vast majority of you, from your fruit juice through to your coffee, through to your cornflakes, whatever you, through your bread, came from soil. And if it wasn't for soil, you wouldn't have had that, that meal. Uh, fish excluded. <laughs> but it's important to identify that healthy soils are not only able to produce this food, but they also carry out other functions and other delivery of ecosystems, goods and services. So I was a little bit nervous about the comment that we have more agricultural land that is out there, potentially. Because that assumes that that land, that soil, isn't providing other functions. And I would argue that soils deliver a whole range of ecosystems, goods and services, of which, yes, agricultural production is one. So these here in this uh, left-hand column identify those ecosystems, goods and services that are delivered by soil. Yes, we have the provisioning function of material goods and services, and what we're talking about today is only one part of that, the food in terms of agricultural production. But look at the other opportunities that we get from soils. It also produces fibre, fodder, fuel. Now, already we've talked about biofuels. And again, everybody thinks this is very green, very environmentally friendly to grow biofuels to avoid the fossil fuel crisis that we're having. But what is actually happening to soil that is produced the biofuels? In the UK, for example, farmers growing more and more maize, which is wonderful as a biofuel, and they're putting it into anaerobic digestion plants, wonderful. But the damage that is being done to that soil, because maize is a very aggressive, erosive crop, causing a lot of land degradation erosion. So on the one hand, we feel great because it's green and it's producing biofuels, but the damage that is being done to the soil is going to reap, again, a pun, sorry, but reap uh, uh, consequences in the future. And I'm seeing this, and we have PhD students that are looking at the impact of biofuel production, for example, on soil quality. But anyway, today is about food, just one of those production. But look at these other services that we get from soils. They regulate our ecosystem processes, 
For example, flood control. We have too much water or we have not enough water. Soils are critical to that. They help drain that water away, preventing flooding, but they also retain that water to hopefully reduce irrigation demand. Again, we've talked this morning about irrigation demand will increase irrigation, but the infrastructure, the costs associated with that investment are huge. Who is paying for that? Who is going to pay for that? And then going down this list, again, it's cultural services like the landscape aesthetic we love in England, our green and pleasant land. That comes from soil. That green and pleasant land comes from soil. Again, recreation amenity, we're meant to have much more recreation time because of the technology improving our efficiency at work. So we have more recreation time. Really? I don't feel that. But anyway, we're meant to. Uh, and again, soils are going to help you play your football, go out on 4x4 four four mountain bikes, and so on and so forth. Protection of heritage, archaeology, very important, soil role in that, and so on. And habitats, we've just had a presentation about pests, pest management. Where are these pests harboured? Often within the soil. So again, if we don't look after our soil, it has impact on the food that we grow. The bottom line is that healthy soils have been linked directly to human health and well-being, not only through the food production component, but also because of all these other wonderful services that we get from soils, and therefore linked to individuals and national economic status. Um, that's reported in the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, a very important policy driver. Okay, all right, that's the PR for soils, wonderful soils, but there are threats to these wonderful resources. Often I call them priceless but undervalued natural resource. And there are threats. Now we know that healthy soils, if you want a shorthand for what is a healthy soil, there's a big debate in the soil science community as to what is a healthy soil, the shorthand for that is you've got five components. Apologies to colleagues in Copenhagen because one of those is hidden. I could do a test, couldn't I, and say, what's the one that's hidden? Okay, so we have organic matter. We have the ability both to hold water but also shed water if we've got flooding conditions. We have soil structure. We have biota. Can anybody think of what that last one is? No, we've got water. We've got water. It's nutrients. Well done, well done. <laughs> to be honest with you, I had to look at that. <laughs> no, very, very important. So those are the key five indicators of soil health that produce all these wonderful crops and so on. But we are seeing that on the downside of this equation, if you like, are these are the degradation processes that are changing soil properties and therefore the ability to deliver these services. By these degradation processes, such as erosion, compaction, salinization, sealing, urban development, infrastructure development that we've heard about, declines in biodiversity and those pests that are living within the soil and so on, declines in organic matter, all of these processes are impacting on these crucial indicators of soil fertility or soil health, if you like. And what is worrying is that we can actually quantify that. It's estimated that 12 million hectares of agricultural land are lost to these soil degradation processes every year. And imagine that is cumulative, added on to those that have already been degraded. So this is occurring every single year. So yes, potentially there might be more agricultural land, but we're also losing agricultural land through these degradation processes. So what are the consequences? Why do we bother? It keeps me in a job, but you might not care about this soil degradation. I'm sure you do. Basically, land degradation, soil degradation leads to an irreversible loss of this natural resource. Soil formation rates, the other side of the equation, very, very slow. Never do a I'm talking to the students now. Don't do a PhD on soil formation because it's very, very slow. So in the three years of your PhD, you're going to get three millimetres growth. So don't, don't do a PhD on the soil formation. Very, very slow. It's irreversible, and this is effectively, for farmers, their most important business asset. And they're losing that asset through these degradation processes. No raw material, no profit. Picking up on the last speaker. 
Yield decline, what we're seeing is this is being reflected by yield decline, not only in the quantity, the yield, but also the quality, the marketable yield of these crops, and the reliability, how much yield I'm getting year on year. This is, again, a photograph I've taken quite close to my home. This is on chalk soils, very, very thin soils, which are eroding. And as that soil depth reduces, I've got less rooting depth, I've got less nutrients, less water holding capacity. Guess what? My yield declines. And you can see that here on the tops of those slopes, very thin soils, very poor yield quality. But it's okay. I can mask that. I'm just going to irrigate that area maybe, or maybe put another bag of nutrients on. I can mask that yield decline. But the costs associated with that are not sustainable. We've done a bit of work for DEFRA, our Department for Farming and Rural Affairs, just in England and Wales, to quantify these costs. Here we have the degradation processes that I mentioned. I'm particularly interested in erosion, for example. And we estimate that in terms of the cost, in terms of yield decline and increased inputs needed to mask that yield decline, we're talking about 30 to 50 million pounds per year, per annum. That's purely England and Wales, which I know compared with Australia is a tiny little country somewhere to the west. But anyway, this is the impact that these processes are having. Very good. Okay. That's my doom and gloom. That's really depressing. I can see everybody looks really depressed. And, oh, but don't worry. I'm going to pick you back up now because there are possible solutions. For example, if we just take one of those processes, soil erosion, we know that there are soil conservation practices, soil erosion control practices. There's a whole list of them. And here's just, in this diagram, just some of those that we've identified. So things like using mulching, using straw or compost. We've got shed loads of compost. What do we do with it? If we put it back onto the land, we might increase organic matter. We might increase structure, increase these healthy indicators, soil indicators. And here's some research that we're doing, looking at how effective that is on asparagus. Uh, we might use engineering structures such as waterways that we've imported from the USDA. This is used commonly in the States, for example. Uh, various tillage techniques that we can use. And I've, we kind of listed all of those, and we've got some idea about how effective these are at reducing erosion rates so that we get much more sustainable soils. And the question is, and I'm surprised we haven't used the term sustainable intensification more than we have, because that seems to be very much a discussion point. But if we do have to increase productivity on land, we're degrading the land. But if we use these mitigation measures, then maybe we have increased productivity, <coughs> yes, but without damaging the environment, which is the definition of sustainable intensification. OK, so in terms of policy, what are the challenges ahead? I think we don't really know the extent, magnitude, and frequency of these soil degradation processes. We really don't know the extent, even within England and Wales, let alone globally. And that's been compounded by some uncertainties. What's the impact of climate change? Extreme weather events, land use competition. Do I grow maize for biofuel, or do I grow maize for feeding population? Where is the priority? Uh, and population growth and urbanization. I mentioned other ecosystems, good, oh, zero minutes now, okay, I got your point. Other <laughs> ecosystems, good and services, not just agricultural production. It's very subtle but noticeable, that I can see. Uh, can land management practices, some of these erosion control <coughs> measures, actually work? Where should we put those? Where are the target? We can't put them everywhere, we haven't got the resources to do that. Where should we target these? And what are those social, economic and political conditions that are going to lead to the adoption and retention of these measures for, not food security, yes, but first, soil security. All right, in conclusion, finishing off, lovely quote, right? Soil science, it's not really that important, not really a matter of life and death. Oh, yes, it is. The thin layer of soil covering the Earth's surface represents the difference between survival and extinction for most terrestrial life. So it kind of doesn't get more important than that. And then again, uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt, the I'm sure you're familiar with this, the nation that destroys its soil destroys itself. Thank you very much. Thank you.